This is um, Paul Gauguin's Tahitian masterpiece. And he gives the title of the uh, painting, his final great one, he did in French Polynesia in the upper left-hand corner. And it says, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Um, I might add parenthetically for, for, before pursuing that theme that he intended to commit suicide. Uh, and after finishing the painting, he was in a state of great depression for a number of reasons. Uh, and a poor physical health was one of them. Uh, and uh, it was his desire to disappear. He had accumulated a lot of arsenic. So he went into the hills up above Papaete, uh, where, as he wrote for the notes he left behind, he uh, wanted to hide his own body uh, and have it consumed by ants before uh, it could be found. He just wanted to disappear. Now, I've monographed the ants of Polynesia uh, with an associate, and we did a thorough study of all of the known ants of, of, of the Polynesian islands. And I can assure you there's no species uh, in French Polynesia that would have eaten Gauguin. But it didn't matter. He changed his mind. He came back down. He went still farther away. The man was trying to get as isolated from Paris as he possibly could. And um, in, uh, he went to the Marquesas. And there, uh, after stirring up a lot of trouble, I don't have time to describe to you, he died. Well, those questions that he asked, uh, where do we come from, what are we, where are we going, happen to be the three central questions of religion and the philosophy. So through millennia, we thought and argued about the first two of those questions, where do we come from and where, what are we, just who are we. They're such an important questions for the main themes of this conference. Who are we, where do we come from, uh, and how do we use that knowledge, that self-understanding, to relate to the rest of life? Um, sometimes it seems that we are not, uh, might solve them, and sometimes not. Perhaps we can. Religion is never going to provide the answers. The reason is that each organized religion, and there are hundreds of them, has its own different creation story in competition with all the others. Each creation story was written in times and circumstances when the authors knew almost nothing about the universe, the planet, life on Earth, prehistory of the human condition, and each considered its creation story, nonetheless, in answer to where do we come from and what are we, and where are we going to be set in stone and superior to all the other creation stories. And each uh, was born from the dreams and speculations of shamans and prophets. They can't all be correct. No two can be correct. None, in fact, is consistent with our growing knowledge of the universe, the planet, life on Earth, or the prehistory of the human condition. Now, we also look in vain to philosophy. Pacey, Professor Richards, and I just was agreeing with him in conversation of what a supremely important subject philosophy is, especially in keeping us straight and delving into the meaning of concepts, as he stressed in his talk yesterday. But generally, to answer the great riddle, we can't turn to philosophy, despite its noble purpose in history, despite its effectiveness in training a mind to inquire and think logically, professional secular philosophy long ago gave up trying to answer the overall question, what is the meaning of life? Most of the history of philosophy is strewn with the wreckage of theories of the conscious mind. After the decline of logical positivism in the middle of the last century and the attempt to join science uh, and logic into a closed system, philosophers scattered in an intellectual diaspora into those areas not yet colonized by science, into intellectual history, semantics, logic, foundational um, mathematics, ethics, 
and most profitably problems of personal life adjustment. That was a joke. Okay, uh, by default, <laughs> the solution of the great riddle has been left to science. The knowledge of the real world that can be tested and shared with every person, what science promises and has already supplied in part is the following. There is a real creation story of humanity and one only, and it's not a myth. It's being worked out and tested and enriched and strengthened uh, step by step. What I'm going to attempt uh, this morning is to tell you that story. It comes together from multiple disciplines, molecular genetics, neuroscience, uh, and, um, the, um, and, and related uh, disciplines. And of course, evolutionary biology to ecology, archaeology and psychology, and history, and I emphasize um, evolutionary biology, uh, and I'm going to make the claim that uh, since the origin of mathematical population genetic theory in the 1920s, all great advances in evolutionary theory have come from scientific natural historians. I would just drop that on you and then move on and hope that maybe somebody will pick me up on that. Now, to make that effort, uh, to empirically work out the great questions of uh, philosophy and religion, let me first define a very high level of uh, called U sociality, EU, that means literally true or uh, real sociality. This is the existence of groups over multiple generations, uh, which adult members rear the young cooperatively and vary their own longevity or reproduction or both in ways that enhance the complexity of social organization and with it the effectiveness of the operation of that group as a whole vis-a-vis -vis other groups. There are countless thousands of animal species that form social groups and some are dramatic uh, like uh, this um, gorilla troop, uh, but Almost all of these fall short of you sociality. They lack a consistent division of reproduction and labor. Uh, in fact, true sociality uh, has originated in the terrestrial part of the planet only very rarely in the history of life uh, to be precise is though all we know are 20 times on which we have on record, variously in um, several kinds of insects, twice in the mole rats of Africa, once in the human line. And it didn't happen at all until quite late in evolutionary time from the early Mesozoic about 150 million years ago. Now I've illustrated two of the world conquerors there uh, from a scene that you can see in uh, the upper rift valley uh, of the great army ant processions and the people who, who watch them. Now, uh, and it's striking that in this very small array of evolutionary times that's a numerically most abundant uh, and ecologically dominant species a tiny set of them originated. Uh, advanced social creatures rule the land. For example, in many parts of uh, the world, including an Amazon where a study of this sort was actually conducted, ants alone weigh four times as many in biomass, four times as much as uh, the combined biomasses of all the vertebrates, the land vertebrates, the birds, mammals, reptiles, um, amphibians. So this is the setting we need to address in order to understand the origin of humanity. And here are the specific questions that biologists and anthropologists are just beginning to address. First, as noted, uh, why uh, <clears throat> does advanced 
social behavior uh, exist at all? And why has it occurred so rarely? Why, given that the condition is so enormously successful? And second, what is the driving force uh, in evolution that brought it on those rare occasions into existence? The first great evolutionary wave of insects in which you find most of the examples of use sociality uh, <clears throat> was 400 million years ago to about 250 million years ago. Uh, there, a vast array of, of uh, insect orders, including some surviving to this day, emerge. And in the middle of this exuberant evolution, so far as we know from fossil records, there is no sign of use sociality in the insects or the invertebrates or the early vertebrates coming ashore. The first termites and uh, ants appeared around 150 million years ago. Not in the Paleozoic, not in the first great wave of insect evolution, but in the Mesozoic. And there were still no eusocial vertebrate animals, in spite of anatomically likely candidates. So, um, in this fanciful uh, depiction, uh, the one on the left, uh, the, the dinosaur on the left, is one of many that were bipedal, had free hands, uh, could have been easily social in the, the degree of, of uh, herding animals or even uh, primates. And yet, nothing like the creature on the right, the dinosaur, thyroid, thyroid uh, originated to take over the world. So we went on past, uh, through and past the Mesozoic, and nothing much happened. To explain what happened, and better, all almost didn't happen. Let me offer the metaphor of the evolutionary maze. Species proceed through this maze, as for example, uh, primitively social or non-social creatures in the upper left, and they enter this maze of evolution, that's that segment of their evolution, and emerge, say, a high social, uh, socially organized species at the bottom left. Um, Species proceed through this maze, step by step, led by uh, action of natural selection generated by a generation, by generation on the genomes they possess in each present instant of time. They can move in one direction or another, or stall, or even regress during that progress. It takes them somewhere, many possible directions, um, enabled by mutation to reach any point in the maze, and that is achieved by a series of particular steps, each of which may or may not take place. If we look retrospectively in the result in which we're interested, in this case, use sociality, then we can speak of these essentially random steps as pre-adaptation. There has to be certain steps taken that we can call pre-adaptation to get them within the threshold so that they are a short distance away from going over into use sociality and this division of labor, including reproductive labor. What is that final step? What is the pre-adaptation? Uh, and here it is. In every case, with no known exception, uh, the final step the critical pre-adaptation taken one step and to take the species within one step in the maze from use social, the uh, achievement of use social sociality is uh, the uh, the building of a nest by a female of fairly complicated and thus expensive structure sometimes accompanied by a male. Then the rearing of the young progressively by the female or, or parent who go foraging and bring home food and rear the young. Now that happens actually quite commonly across a couple of insect orders, but only very rarely does this next step 
the final step to use sociality up here. And that final step is that mom and the kids stay together after they reach maturity instead of dispersing and then starting the cycle again as solitary insects. Uh, here we have two examples right at the, uh, having crossed the use sociality threshold. Uh, on the upper left are uh, San Alfied um, shrimp. They live in hollows and dug out hollows and uh, sponges and coral reefs. Uh, you have a queen in the middle. You have a uh, guard um, who is not involved in reproduction uh, guarding the entrance. That's an A there. Uh, guarding it on top and B, you have one of the uh, primitively few social bees, uh, which are enormously successful, but uh, wherein uh, only once or very few number of times we had use sociality appearing as a um, as as a great step forward. Now I'm going to turn to humans and make note first that a few species a few species of animals are at the threshold chimpanzees and gorillas for example are shown here african wild dogs but they have not taken the final step well, african wild dogs are so close to it with a with an alpha female and foragers that bring food to a, the resident population that you could call them eusocial but they're right at the margin I'm going to use recent primary research literature to trace the steps, in other words, the lucky pre-adaptations that led from the split between the pre-human and chimpanzee line, lines about six million years ago. Uh, this is a synthesis uh, based upon a great deal of work by a lot of gifted scientists around the world. I will take credit for none of it except to synthesize it. We start with um, the first step, shown, in fact, um, almost by the chimps. <clears throat> and that was to come out of the trees, or at least a substantially arboreal existence, and walk on hind legs. The chimps have done both of these, but their walk is not erect. It is knuckle walking, still essentially four-footed. However, chimps have uh, made great strides, as for example uh, in Senegal here where <clears throat> chimps use animal bones to dig up tubers. Uh, and there are many other culturally past adaptations that particular chimp troops uh, use. They're bipedal, they have tools, uh, they even have in their culture stone throwing, um, but uh, they really never crossed over. During that six million year separation they've had from the hominoid line, uh, the habitat in which humans did evolve, the African savanna, uh, <clears throat> is a biome that ranges from tree dotted grassland to open dry seasonal forest. And I've frequently um, been enjoyed traveling around in the, this environment uh, in the last three trips to uh, Mozambique myself and experience what many people go to Africa in that region, particularly in the Rift Valley, experience an early sense of belonging, sense of being in a familiar place, a home. I won't dwell on why you might feel that way yet, but I'll save it for later challenges and questions if you wish. Now let us take the first step. Known uh, from uh, uh, Artipithecus 4.4 million years ago, uh, bipedal, and now it come down, it was erect, really erect walking. It had another necessity uh, fleshy palms and fingers, I believe, is a necessity for evolving eusociality in a mammal. And I'm so convinced that, that it's necessary for the forehand to be able to manipulate objects that it have um, 
pulpy fingertips with sensitivity and ability to manipulate small objects. I'm so convinced that that is a necessity that I am now warning future script writers of alien uh, invasion movies not to show aliens with claws or fangs. Fangs are for males to compete and claws are for uh, predation and, and defense. <clears throat> we want our ancestors, uh, we want the aliens to have fleshy palms and fingers. Um, now came a next step. We haven't got the steps worked out thoroughly, but from something like Artipithecus, the Australopithecus. Uh, and these, uh, the, these, there was an adaptive radiation of, a, of these, as many as three or four species, all alive at the same time, showing different degrees of at least uh, toughness of vegetation that they were using as their food. From one of the species of the Australopith adaptive radiation, an evolutionary line developed that listed not just Australopithecus, not just old world primates and mammals, but all of life to an entirely new level. And that occurred uh, about, started occurring about three million years ago and was manifested in the dramatic increase in brain size as illustrated here, particularly the memory storing regions of the cortex. Now prior to this time, the prehuman brain size at 400 to 500 cubic centimeters was approximately the size of that of a chimp. Then brain size increased dramatically uh, at what was possibly the fastest rate for a complex uh, organ ever. What was going on three to two million years ago? The crucial event occurred at about the time the species that we now put in the genus Homo, Homo habilis, or Homo ergaster, depending on which fossils you use, uh, was that they shifted to a greater consumption of meat. Very likely, they'd been feeding occasionally on small animals as do chimps today, which even hunt vervet monkeys. But in addition, at best guess, the shifted reliance to animals of all sizes were killed by lightning-struck ground fires. Meat, if you can get it, is energetically more efficient per gram, and cooked meat, which has, was available to them as fire killed, is easiest to de eat and digest. What began the runaway growth of brain size, I believe, was not just the consumption of meat. It was the way meat is harvested. Animals that live in groups and hunt typically do so from dens, as in wild dogs and wolves, where some stay to protect the young while others hunt for prey and scavenge meat to bring home. It's right about here, in other words, three to two million years that pre-humans created campsites. They started using protected nests. Campsites are the nest of the pre-humans destined to become eusocial, where offspring can be raised progressively in other words, they came to the threshold of eusociality, it would seem, just as in all other known eusocial species, reach and cross that threshold, for which we can con uh, confidently reconstruct the event. This is a rule without known exception, as I said uh, earlier, among uh, which um, 19 other examples of which we have knowledge uh, on uh, the land in shallow sea in one case occurred. Now when you li live in close contact, and I'm now going to shift to a large body of knowledge accumulated by social psychologists and cognitive psychologists, when you live in close contact in the same place, when you no longer travel about in loose groups searching for fruit and other vegetables through uh, food, maybe signaling to the others of your find, as do chimps. When you divide labor, then the reading of intention becomes vital. It becomes vital to understand what the individuals cooperating with you uh, is likely to be. Um, and you now turn much more to body language, to uh, verbal signals, 
uh, to judge, the facial expression to judge what others think and want. That's vital in order to develop the high level of cooperation that we see underlines, at least in humans, uh, what uh, has become a highly advanced condition of youth social, um, uh, youth social evolution. It is based upon social intelligence. By the time of Homo erectus, an apparent direct descendant of, uh, this is Habilis, uh, reconstruction of Habilis, we don't have direct evidence because there's just not enough fossil evidence to check it one way or the other, of a uh, campsite uh, in Habilines, Habilines and the, pre the precursors of Erectus. But we have it for Erectus, and that's what's really interesting and important. Um, by the time of Homo Erectus, in the reconstruction here, descendants of the Habilines and direct ancestors of our own species, Homo sapiens, Campsites were well developed. Fire had been controlled at the campsite. Control fire is essential. Controlled high energy source, essential. Uh, stone tools had been widely adopted. Brain size was significantly increased over that of the Habilines and growing rapidly. By 60,000 million, sorry, 60,000 years ago, Homo sapiens uh, were fully evolved, in some populations at least, into our present form. And the breakout from Africa occurred uh, <clears throat> up the Nile corridor during a pluvial period probably, followed by rapid spread through population growth all the way to Australia. Uh, Australia. The physical appearance and early culture of these pioneers is preserved in a few places. The Mobuti pygmies of the Congo, the little Andamanese, pygmies of the northern Luzon, people of New Guinea and Australia. Uh, <clears throat> now to the next key question I propose. What drove one of several pre-human Australopithecine lines to the eusocial threshold? It was almost certainly, and here I'm becoming heretical, but I fully expect this to be uh, the accepted view if it's not already. It's not heresy anymore. Uh, group selection. As William James once said, history is a bloodbath. And we know that that was the case very early in history. And we, uh, what we've looked on as extreme aggressiveness, for example, uh, in the Yanomamo of northern South America and other warlike people has been true of all our species, one or another, peer periodically or even continuously. Vengeance raids were, uh, as uh, the um, Mayans gleefully depicted it in their paintings and left behind for us to see, uh, were succeeded by organized, um, divinely sanctioned war as was so vividly and proudly shown here. Uh, from the best evidence we have in damaged skeletons and cave paintings, raids and battles were common all the way back into the Paleolithic. Uh, of course, it wasn't all war. Group selection is not all violent. Uh, it can be simply the competition between groups uh, that um, result in differences in uh, efficiency of resource extraction, resource discovery and resource extraction. Let me remind you, uh, just in passing, of the basic process of uh, individual level natural selection as an imaginary shift of plumage color in a bird population. I, uh, I ap ap apologize for not going right down to the molecular basis of the origin of feathers as it was done brilliantly yesterday. Uh, but at any rate, this will um, remind us that in the simplest conceivable case, you have competing alleles, different forms of the same gene. The trait prescribed by one of the alleles for dark view in this imaginary case results in a higher genetic fitness, meaning greater longevity, reproduction, or both. Over a number of generations, the dark blue gene, which is the one I decided to give superiority to in this competition, uh, replaces the competing light blue genes. 
individual natural selection of genetic traits. This is the distinction I'll now make for you between individual selection and group selection. And in abandoning the long prevailing theory of kin selection as the, uh, as the explanation of advanced sociality and replacing it with uh, slightly modified, uh, modified by making it multi-level uh, models of, of uh, population genetics, established population genetics. What, that's the breakthrough that I and my mathematician friends and a few others have been making in the last um, 10 years. And that's what I'm referring to now. Some of you will have in your mind, that, oh, this is very controversial, becoming less so every day. I'm going now to explain about individual level selection and group selection, exactly what it is in just a few words. Individual natural selection of genetic traits occurs when members of the group within the group compete with members of the same group. Group natural selection, group selection, occurs when groups compete with other groups on the basis of interactions of social individuals within groups, just in common sense. How well you cooperate, how well you order your affairs, how well you seek things collectively and uh, invent new things and conduct defense against um, aggressive neighbors makes the difference. That is the trait that these are the interactive traits, social traits, which evolve like any other uh, genetically based uh, uh, property. There's nothing radically new about that. It's just a matter of making natural selection multi-level, individual level selection occurring, also group versus group. And here is what is important. This distinction between individual and group selection is open to precise genetic analysis, unlike uh, the uh, twist of the very tortured and, and increasingly obscure models of kin selection. Uh, it is open to precise genetic analysis simply by the two-part uh, classification of the traits, that is, the phenotypes prescribed by genes affecting variously individual traits and group level traits. The phenotypic targets of group selection uh, uh, traits are the inherited forms of interaction among members of the same group. It is rare, as I've stressed, that group selection prevails over individual selection. Very rare for it to get started at the uh, use sociality threshold for reasons we haven't yet plumbed that we, we don't know why really why it has occurred so rare. Uh, but maybe it is because it does create altruism in new social societies. It happens through the following balance of individual selection and group selection. And this is like a mantra among those of us who are uh, pursuing this analysis now. Within groups, selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals. Within groups, I'll repeat, selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals. But groups of altruists beat groups of selfish individuals. So there is a constant, um, constant um, antagonism or, 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 or contravailing of the two forces of, um, of selection acting in all youth social groups, highly social groups. And uh, I'm going now to um, uh, descend to the level of Charlie Rose, with whom I'll be in a week or two. That is to say, sin, if you please, is favored by individual selection, you know, with selfishness and so on. And virtue, if you please, uh, stay with me, is favored by group selection. The conflict between individual selection and group selection is unstable in genetic evolution. Uh, the instability is responsible for a large part of the content of the humanities. 
The creative art consists largely of a telling and the retelling and telling yet again in different contexts with different characters the same story of, uh, of, uh, the, co of the uh, conflict of the products of individual and group selection. Um, and um, of course, I um, am not demeaning the humanities because in a book I'm bringing out this fall, uh, modestly entitled The Meaning of Human Existence, uh, I, I will uh, explain why I think that a um, out of space, a uh, spaced intelligence, another intelligence, uh, would look at us, maybe after having perfected its science 100 million years ago, that's possible, consistent with the history of the galaxy, would say, what's worth learning from that brand new you social species down there? Uh, they would say the humanities. That is the unique thing they cannot duplicate, they cannot fathom without understanding it and studying it thoroughly. That's why I've, I've, I've listed one chapter, or entitled a chapter, uh, The All Importance of the Humanities. The overall perception of the origin of human condition, I think, throws light um, on the origin of culture, of language, morality, or religion. I'm not claiming that it does, but I think it's provided a portal, an entree, into uh, for evolutionary biology and for uh, human genetics uh, to do a better job of uh, throwing light upon the origins of culture, language, morality, religion, and the creative arts of the kind that are now well underway by new scholars in various fields. It also offers promise that at long last, the three great branches of learning, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities can be linked in a new and at last interesting manner. Uh, and I hope uh, that in going slightly off course here in presenting this material and these ideas which are under testing and of course easily disputed in many respects, uh, I've indicated uh, my belief that we will not solve the great dilemma of conservation and the pre preservation and the proper care uh, and understanding that goes with it of uh, the rest of life that we're meeting here for until we have a much better self-understanding as a species. Where do we come from? What are we? And above all, where are we going? I hope I've added a little bit with this, and I thank you for listening. Thank you.